Okay, um, I will call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of May 20th, 2024. We have one substantive hearing this morning on the UVM Medical Center Outpatient no, I'm, Surgery I'm Center. Are we, on the are we on the record? We can go on the record, please, Maggie, yeah. Okay, we are now on the record. On the record. All right. Good morning, my name is Owen Foster. I'm the chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm calling to order our hearing of May 20th, 2024. We have one substantive agenda item, which is a hearing on UVM Medical Center's Outpatient Surgery Center Certificate of Need application. Um, we have everyone from UVM here, and we have everyone from the board. I thank you everyone for being here promptly uh, for today's hearing. It could, could be lengthy given all the materials. Um, Mike Barber is our general counsel, and he will be the hearing officer today. So I will turn it over to Mr. Barber. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you heard, my name is Michael Barber. I'll be at the hearing officer for today's hearing. This is a hearing on the University of Vermont Medical Center's application for a certificate of need to develop an outpatient surgery center on Tilly Drive in South Burlington. The docket number for the case is GMCB-004-23 CON. The hearing is being held pursuant to Title 18 of the Vermont Statutes, Chapter 221, Subchapter 5, as well as Green Mountain Care Board Rule 4. Um, before we kind of go further, I just want to make sure I have uh, the party's representatives on the on the call. Um, so uh, I think I saw Karen Tyler and Eric Miller for the Applicant University of Vermont Medical Center, Karen or Eric, is there anyone else? Um, um, no, um, Eric and I are both present. Okay, thank you. And uh, for the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, I think I saw Sam Peisch and Charles Becker on. Yep, morning, we're here. Is no Eric here as well? Okay, thank you. And uh, the other interested parties are um, AFT Vermont. I believe I saw Deborah Snell on the line. Yes, I am here. Is there anyone else uh, I should mention here? No. Okay. And is someone from Northwestern Medical Center on the line? Yes, Jonathan Billings is here, uh, Chief Operating Officer, and our CEO and President Peter Wright. Uh, will be going in and out as he moves through airports today. Thank you. And the last interested party is Copley Hospital. Is there someone from Copley on? Yep, uh, uh, Joseph Wooden, and um, I'll be periodically in and out with some other issues, but thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, just want to quickly go over some some housekeeping rules and reminders. Uh, the first and maybe the most important is please mute your lines when you're not speaking. Um, there's a lot of people on the call and um, uh, opportunity for a lot of feedback if that's not um, kept on top of. Uh, the second uh, thing is we may have disabled it, but if we haven't, please do not use the chat function in Teams. Um, when you speak, please try to speak loudly and clearly and try not to go too fast. Um, we do have a court reporter here who's transcribing the proceedings. Um, <clears throat> when speaking, representatives and witnesses should be on camera, if at all possible. If you're not speaking, uh, you don't have to be on camera. Um, if someone who is key to these proceedings has technical difficulties, for example, they get dropped from the call, uh, we can we can take a pause while that gets sorted out. Um, but I just need to know to do that. So if you see someone on you know on your team that uh, is having trouble, please speak up or send me an email or something to let me know uh, that we need to take a recess or something to sort that out. Um, the, the basic schedule for today is going to be as follows. 
we're first going to hear from uh, the University of Vermont Medical Center. They have a number of witnesses who are scheduled to speak. After UVMMC's presentation, um, interested parties and then board members will have a chance to ask questions of UVMMC's witnesses. Um, I'll just let the parties know now that we are probably going to have a brief executive session uh, as part of the board member questions to discuss confidential portions of the record. So we'll have to sort that out. Um, after UVMMC's presentation and questions, interested parties will have uh, an opportunity to speak and explain their position on the application. And then finally, board members will have an opportunity to ask questions of the interested parties if they have any. And then we will take public comment at the end of the hearing. Um, unfortunately, I can't say with any certainty when we will get to the public comment. I would very much like to at least have the last hour from four to five for that. Um, and of course, we will try to work in some breaks throughout the day. <clears throat> um, given the degree of public interest in this project, we have created a sign in sheet for providing public comment today. Um, that sign up sheet can be accessed by going to the board's website on the board meeting information page. Um, and so once we get to that portion of the hearing, I will start there um, with people who signed up. Um, if there are members of the public here who don't want to stick around until the end of the day to provide comments or can't come back towards the end of the, um, the, of the hearing, uh, you can always provide the board with a written comment. Written comments are being accepted on this application through May 30th. Uh, and instructions for providing a comment are on the board's website, or you can call the board and we can help you figure out how to provide a comment. Um, so, uh, before we turn things over to UVMMC, um, Title 18 of the Vermont Statutes Annotated Section 9440A requires that any testimony taken today be taken under oath. So um, I just need to swear in the presenters for UVMMC. And given the number of speakers, uh, I'd like to do this all at once to uh, keep the flow going. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call out the names of the individuals who I believe are scheduled to speak and um, when I call your name if you could just please take yourself off mute and say that you're present and then once I've confirmed that I have everyone who I I think I need I will um, administer an oath so uh, is Thomas Morris with us present and do we have Scott Walters here present Susan Anderson. Present. Mary Broadworth. Present. Uh, Dr. Coleman. Present. Chris Dillon. Present. Dr. Epen. Present. Eve Hoare. Present. Dr. Leffler. Present. Uh, Beth Sinu. Present. Mark Stanislaus. Present. Rick Vincent. Present. And Dr. Bender. Present. Karen, did I miss anyone? I don't believe so, but I think that's everyone. I okay. I believe you may have missed me. Dr. Mark. Oh, Plant. sorry, Dr. Plant. We miss Dr. Plant. And me as well. I would miss me too. <laughs> that sounded like there was someone else. Sorry, who was Hello, that? Right. Dr. Uh, Nichols. Okay. Um, if you could all please raise your right hand. Please raise oh. your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence you shall give 
relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. Thank you. OK, um, do any of the parties or board members have anything we need to address or discuss before I turn things over to EVMMC? OK, Karen, floor is yours. Hey, good morning, everyone. I am Karen Tyler, representing uh, the University of Vermont Medical Center, and I will turn things over to Dr. Ethan to get us started. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Chair Foster, board members, for moving this proposal forward and welcoming us to this certificate of need hearing. I want to just start by saying that everything that we do is guided by the principle of how do we best serve our patients and communities? And how do our patients access the care that they need and deserve? This project is a perfect example of that guiding philosophy. We're proposing this project for one reason. It meets an urgent, it meets an urgent patient need, and that need is only gonna grow with every year we don't take action. As a health system, we're here to keep our patients and communities as healthy as possible and to provide timely access to high quality, equitable care. As this, board no, as this board knows, many of our patients do not have timely access to the surgical care that they need. The result of that lack of access is increased suffering and increased costs as some patients grow sicker waiting for care. And as you'll hear today, without this proposed outpatient surgery center, access to surgical care will get far, far worse as our population grows and ages. Development of a multi-specialty outpatient surgery center is a key step we're taking to increase access to surgical care. It's really the only answer to that crucial question of how our patients access the surgical care they need and deserve today, 10 years from now, and beyond that. Ultimately, I want our patients and everyone who lives in this region to view us as more than their health care provider. I want them to see us as their allies and their advocates in making our communities as vibrant and as healthy as they can be. We're here today to simply advocate on behalf of the people we serve in asking you to approve our application for the Outpatient Surgery Center. Finally, I just wanna mention that I'm extremely proud of the team you're gonna hear from today, as well as the team that's worked behind the scenes and persevered to get us to this moment. The experts presenting our plan to you are incredibly talented and dedicated to delivering the absolute best care to our patients. Because here at the UVM Health Network, we know we're serving our friends, our neighbors, and our family members. Thank you all ahead of time for being here today. And I wanna ask Steve Leffler, the president of the UVM Medical Center, to take it from here. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dr. Epen. The truth is, we actually need the Outpatient Surgery Center now. Over the past 18 months, our clinical leaders in surgery, anesthesia, periop, had done tremendous work to improve access to our operating rooms. We currently have 20 operating rooms on the main campus and five at the Fannie Allen. You'll hear through the presentation today that we've done many things over 18 months to improve the efficiency of those ORs and get them to really about as much capacity as you can squeeze out of them and even with that hard work, we're still building up patient backlogs. This project will both address the short-term need right now that we're feeling every day currently, but also into the future. Our experts, as well as the Green Mountain Care Board experts, agreed that by 2030, without this project, more than 4,000 people who need surgical care will either have to wait too long travel out of state, or potentially not receive care at all. That's 20,000 people over five years, and you can do the math, it just exponentially grows. The proposed outpatient surgery center on the day it opens will have eight operating, operating rooms, which five of them will replace the five ORs at the Fannie Allen campus, and there'll be three 
net new operating rooms. The outpatient surgery center will allow us to treat more patients in a convenient outpatient setting. We know that's what our patients want and prefer to be able to park easily, get care in a timely fashion, go home that same day when it makes sense. And equally important, we know that our providers and our learners want and need that as well. You're gonna hear from one of our residents today. When residents choose the programs they go to, they wanna make sure they can train with the equipment and space for how they're gonna go out into practice. To continue to attract high quality learners to Vermont, we need to have high quality facilities to train them in as they will see in their future. We know that many residents after they train here stay in Vermont across the state. It's important that we have facilities that will meet their training needs and their future needs. Most of the volume that will be in the, I'm sorry, all the volume at the outpatient surgery center clearly will be people to go home that day. We also have major challenges on the inpatient campus. At UVM Medical Center, every day we have challenges doing all of the cardiothoracic, neurosurgery, and vascular surgery procedures that only happen at UVM Medical Center in Vermont. We need more OR inpatient capacity for those patients. Moving outpatient surgeries that are now happening on the main campus to the OSC will really help that capacity and make sure that our inpatient ORs are available for the sickest Vermonters who need them every day. Across our region, patients are oftentimes waiting too long for inpatient procedures because our ORs are so full every single day. $130 million price tag is expensive. There's no question about that. Our experts and the Green Mountain Care Board experts agreed that's what a project of this size and scale costs. We've spent years of planning for this project and have carefully reserved capital spending to make sure that we can afford this project. Building it now with four ORs as shell space is smart for the future. It preserves dollars that would otherwise be needed to add on to the project and it keeps the project operating at full capacity rather than having to open and close parts of the project as we're doing additional additions. I want to say that we are currently, we have a CON submitted to purchase the Feeney Allen campus. And many people have asked, why can't you just upgrade the ORs at the Feeney Allen campus? The ORs at the Feeney Allen campus have served a great purpose for us, and they're operating at full capacity right now but they're 50 years old and they're small rooms. At best, they're around 450 square feet. Modern outpatient surgical facilities are at least 600 square feet. There's equipment that we can't put in those rooms. We can't turn them over as quickly as we want to. We can't move different cases in and out of the rooms in a timely fashion. They will never meet the needs of a modern outpatient surgical facility. The Finney Island Campus is a key part of our future mission and the space that we're using it for the ORs now will absolutely be repurposed to a better use. But those, those ORs are not gonna solve our 4,000 patient problem or be able to deliver the surgical care that Vermonters deserve over the next two to three decades. Already right now today, we are transferring and sending appropriate surgical cases to Central Vermont Medical Center and Porter Medical Center. More than 100 cases this year are going to go from the medical center just to Central Vermont Medical Center. But that's really around the fringes. They have a little OR capacity on a Wednesday or a Friday afternoon. We have a surgeon and anesthesiologist that can go back and forth. The small additional capacity we can squeeze out of those opportunities will never meet the need for what Vermonters need over the next decades. Just not enough capacity there. And we expect their ORs to get busier as well. Our projections show that in Chittenden County and the, and the area that we serve, Vermonters are getting older. We do have an increasing capacity uh, um, population in, in Chittenden County, and they will need more surgery. We will show you that we can safely staff the new facility and that our staff will want to work there. It'll be a modern facility with good parking it'll meet the needs for us to be able to attract good people to work here. We're very excited about what this project will bring for the patients that we serve. 
We know that we have access challenges right now. Building this appropriately sized current modern space is one piece of addressing our access challenges. Over the morning, you're gonna hear from Dr. Mark Plant, who's our chief of Uro urologic surgery, sharing his perspective on the benefits of the proposed OSC. Next, you're gonna hear from Eve Hoare and Hulse Advisors on why this project is sized appropriately to meet the needs of our patients. Next, you're gonna hear from uh, Marissa Coleman, Beth Sanu and Eve Hoare on why this project will meet our patient population needs, our DEI objectives, and how we will be able to serve our populations there. Mary Broadworth and Chris Dillon will talk about how we'll staff the facility. Rick Vincent, Eve Hoare, and Mark Stanislaus will discuss the finances behind this project, and why it makes financial sense. And finally, and actually most importantly, you're gonna hear from our additional physicians, a patient, and one of our residents on the critical importance of this project for the patients that we serve. You'll hear from Dr. Mark Plant, Dr. Claude Nichols, Dr. Heather Harrington, Dr. Patrick Bender, and Haley Reese, one of our residents, the critical nature of this project to meet the needs of the patients that we serve. Thank you so much for allowing us to present this project today. We're proud of the work that went into it and proud to show what we believe will serve Vermonters for many years. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Plant. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, I'm Mark Plant, project surgeon in UVM for 28 years. I've served as the division chief of urology for now the better part of 15 years. And most important for today, I've been the surgeon lead um, on the periot management team, which was a team constructed three years ago to bring us out the throes of COVID where, as you may know, many of the ORs were shut down. This team is comprised of another physician, Dr. Patrick Bender, as the anesthesia lead, as well as a quality partner and the director of surgical services. I want to take the opportunity to thank you for uh, providing me the audience to echo and amplify both Dr. Epen and Dr. Leffler's comments and give you a, a high level overview of what uh, our team does and Oh, you know, overseas in terms of all the operative services at the University of Vermont Medical Center. It's an immutable fact that our population is aging, as well as growing in some areas, as well as the fact that the complexity of disease also is going up. What this means is that the cadre of surgical services that we're expected to provide as Vermont's only um, uh, level one trauma center and also the center that has to provide the complexity of disease regarding robotics, cardiothoracic surgery, and other elements as you've heard. What we've also seen is that our operative spaces are now fully subscribed. With historic numbers of cases compared to the last decade, we find ourselves over full. There is no room at the I also need add um, that access issues certainly do uh, exist, and they also exist in our inpatient spaces. So what this means for us is every day there's a one o'clock meeting where all the um, heads for the following day and weeks looking at the schedule have to play a very complicated game of Tetris to try and find space across what is a disparate number of rooms on the main campus, as well as the Fanny, as you've heard, that sometimes are too small to be able to provide some of the complex surgeries. I'm often quoted as saying, we are not a nip and tuck institution. Um, we are actually providing a lot of the care that can't be uh, provided at outside centers. I can tell you that the Division of Urology has been a partner with many of the community hospitals for these decades that I've been here, but it is the reality that there are many surgeries that cannot be done in smaller hospitals. So with that as the backdrop, um, I appreciate your attention to the following comments and certainly will be available for questions later. Thank you, Mark. Next up, we'll hear from Eve Horn Hulse Advisors on the 
size of the project and the work behind that. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Eve Hoar, and um, I serve as the leader of the um, network team that does strategic and business planning for um, all the partners in the UVM Health Network. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you today about um, how we estimated the size of um, the um, outpatient surgery center as we began this this project. Um, so as you heard from Dr. Plant, from Dr. Epen, and from Dr. Leffler, um, despite a lot of work to create more capacity and fit patients in the best that we can, we are essentially operating at capacity. Um, and while we're um, working on again, uh, doing our very best to get as much out of the operating rooms as we can um, and, um, and doing the, the best with our surgical teams. Um, we also know that um, the demand for care is increasing. Um, I'll go um, and spend a little bit of time about our um, forecast for the area population. It's been an interesting journey since COVID about um, population estimates, and I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, and then we'll we'll start with that as the main driver and talk about the forecast for surgical care between um, 2019 and 2030. Um, and then I'll turn it over to my partner, Scott Walters from HALSA, um, and we'll translate that need for surgeries into the number of ORs um, that we estimated needed to be in the outpatient surgery center. So um, we focused on 10-year population growth estimates um, for Chittenden County. And remember that we started this journey kind of back in early 2021, about three years ago today. Um, at that point in time, it would have been really nice to have the 2020 census forecasts um, available to us, um, but we were all waiting for those. Um, so back in 2021, um, we actually took a look at two different um, population forecasts. Um, one that, um, that, that looked at growth, particularly in the northwestern corner of Vermont, very, very similarly to the way it had been done in the past. Um, and um, we decided to commission a second forecast with a group called Public Opinion Strategies. And given all the building that we saw going around, um, around us in northwestern Vermont, decided to use that. Oh, if we'd stay on that slide, that would be great. Um, so our estimate of the population growth in Chittenden County um, was 6% over the next 10 years, significantly higher than had been previously forecast. Um, Recently, um, we updated the population forecast given some new Cl Nielsen Claritas um, forecast, population forecast data. And remarkably, that population growth estimate for the 10 year period um, remained at 6%. So we feel very confident about, about this growth forecast for the population. Um, where we have a little bit of a difference in the forecast is the growth of that 65 and over population. And this is really key because it's it's that population um, relative to other segments of the population is typically a higher utilizer of, um, of, of health care, as we know. And in particular, um, in surgical services, is, is goes along with that. So we have a range of forecasts. We have a 62%, 65 and over growth rate over 10 years. Um, for the um, from public opinions back in 2021, um, and much more recently um, from our um, from our intelligence partner uh, SG2 and Claritas, we um, see a 41 percent growth rate in that 65 and over population. I'll talk in the next slide about how how that is significant. Um, and, and not so significant when we take a look at the surgical forecast um, over time. Before I leave this slide, I wanna mention though, it's not just Chittenden County that's seeing this growth. Um, we know growth forecasts predict um, population growth in Franklin County, significant population growth um, in Grand Isle County, um, and also in counties like Washington and Addison. Um, so this is a Northwestern growth um, population phenomenon that I'm sure you've heard about in other venues. We can go to the next slide. Thanks, Sorry. 
So again, taking that population, one one of the drivers, one one major driver in in this growth in surgical, um, in our surgical estimate, um, as looking at at this graph here. So the bars you see here in gray are our actuals. Um, so we started with 2019. We're we're um, about 19,000 surgeries a year, and that's inpatient and outpatient surgeries combined. You can see the dip. Um, when when COVID hit, um, and you can see the, the the rise in volumes after that. And these these, as you might know, these volumes reflect COVID, the impact of a cyber attack, um, and then the air quality issues we had in the Fanning Islands. So that that trend is coming up a little more slowly than it would be in other in other places because of the circumstances for us. Um, but that's the picture with the actuals. Now I want you to focus, if you would, for starters, on the dark green bars. So that is the um, projected growth um, of surgeries over, um, through till 2030 um, that's based on the public opinion strategies population forecast um, and the SG2 forecasting model um, that we had in 2021. And I want to say this. What I've learned about facilities planning is you need to start with how big the facility needs to be. And so getting an early estimate that wasn't an underestimate so to figure out how big we needed to make this outpatient surgery center was really critical to bring forward to our facilities partners at the time. So, um, the dark green bars reflect a 22% in our total surgeries over this 10-year period. Okay, um, and again, recently, the Green Mountain Care Board asked us to go back and based on um, more recent population forecasts and a more recent SG2 uh, forecast of surgical demand um, to recast that demand. And so the light green bars reflect that recasting of demand. And again, this shows a slightly lower, a 17% growth over 10 years um, in the demand for surgeries um, for this region. All right. Uh, the thing I'd also like to say is we make a pretty big deal in our um, CON application that we um, assume that our market share stays the same. And you might wonder how we do this. Um, and, the, and the reason is, is because we started with our own baseline volumes and grew those volumes by um, the expected growth for the entire region. And so it was very important to us that we respect the role of our, our regional partner organizations um, to, um, to take advantage of market growth or to serve that market growth. Um, as as their institutions um, allow them to do so. So I just want to confirm that because of the approach, I am very confident um, that we retain the same market share and that the surgical growth that we're showing is not dependent on stealing market share from any of our partners. All right, so with this um, surgical forecast, the next job was to take that forecast and translate it into our need for ORs. Not a small job because we have surgeries that last anywhere from 30 or 40 minutes to um, two plus hours. Um, and so to do this, we turn to our partner, HALSA Advisors, and I'm gonna turn it next to Scott Walters to talk about that part of the process. Thank you, Eve. Uh, this is Scott Walters, uh, partner with HALSA Advisors. And the, the, the way that we do that, the first step after you've reached agreement on the number of cases is to calculate how many surgical minutes will those cases reflect uh, five years out and 10 years out. And just like we, just like uh, Eve started with existing uh, caseloads, uh, we started with existing case lengths. So step two is, is to get projected minutes by service line. Uh, we do all of, the, all of our work uh, by at the service line level and separating inpatient and outpatient cases. So as the, and we always start with the actual data. So uh, everything was built initially off 2019 data. 
we looked at later years and the case length by service line by inpatient or outpatient uh, held very constant over the, the period between uh, 2019 and the more recent data we looked at, it was 2021. So we said, let's just stick with what we've got. Uh, so it's all based off of actual 2019 data. And we took the, the minutes per case by service line and by uh, inpatient outpatient and basically applied those historical case lengths to the future case lengths. And the reason we, we stick with historical data versus trying to use any sort of a, a benchmark is uh, every institution is different. So the, the types of urologic cases, the types of vascular cases, the types of cardiac cases, and the mix that we have, it, it generally tends to be unique to an institution. And again, generally tends to be fairly consistent over time. Uh, the other thing that we, changes that we don't assume are that what goes on within the OR with the surgical team, while the new ORs are going to make it more easy to assign a room to a team, it's going to be roughly the same team doing the same types of cases to the same types of patients. And the actual surgical process that the surgeons and the anesthesiologists are, are completing uh, are, are going to stay roughly the same, whether it's in the current environment or the new environment. So, uh, we hold those case lengths constant. We multiply the new number of cases times the, the historical case length. That gives me total minutes uh, of case time. So wheels in to wheels out from the time the patient enters the room to the time the patient leaves the room for the total number of surgical cases within each specialty. The next thing we do is we add a turnaround uh, allocation to that. And here we have to make a choice. Are we gonna go with the historical turnaround times that the institution has had, or are we, if, if, are we gonna use a, a, a benchmark? And the judgment we make there is if, if we look at the current facility and we can identify one, that there is a discrepancy between their current performance and, and what a, a reasonable benchmark is, generally they're on the long side, and critically two, we can identify a facility reason for that discrepancy, uh, and we know that we can fix that issue with the new facility, then we'll go with the benchmark, otherwise we go with the actual data. And in this instance, uh, we looked at the, at the actual performance, we looked at benchmarks, and they were very close, and in the case of the outpatient cases at the Fannie Allen, uh, the actual performance and the benchmark performance were identical in a couple of years or plus minus one or two minutes. So we actually we went with the actual, which also ended up being the benchmark. So you add the turnaround time, that gives you your total minutes of demand uh, by, locate, by type of case and by service line. And the final step then is to say, okay, if I've got this many minutes of total demand, how many ORs do I need to meet that total demand? So we factor in how many hours of utilization per day, uh, and what is the utilization percentage target that I have? So we assumed that we would have 250 days a year, uh, 10 hours per day at all of the sites. These are fairly, even the outpatient surgery center is a, a fairly large site. At larger sites, we forecast a 10 hour day. Smaller sites uh, sometimes struggle to staff a 10 hour day. So we usually use an eight hour day at a smaller site. All of these are at the 10 hour, and we always used uh, a 75% utilization target. So uh, that utilization target really does two things. Uh, in the inpatient side, it allows me to have a little bit of flex uh, in the schedule so I can get add-ons, uh, emergency cases, acute care surgery, uh, acute LEO patients added, trauma patients added to the schedule. Um, and, and we think there will be a few of those types of cases at the outpatient center. Um, things that can be done on an outpatient and things that it might need to be done tomorrow or the next day. It doesn't need to be done instantaneously. So a, a wrist fracture would be a great example of that where it's actually beneficial to wait a day or two before you, you perform the case. Uh, the other thing that that 75% allocation uh, allows for are things that go wrong that cancel a case. So whether it's, you know, a, a snowstorm wipes out and a blizzard wipes out an entire day of production, uh, whether it's, you know, other weather related or whether it's patient related. Uh, this particular patient, we thought everything was, was going great. They came in the morning of surgery, 
Uh, their vital signs are inappropriate for surgery. The case is canceled unexpectedly. I'm not going to be able to backfill that time. And I, if I need to have enough capacity to account for those things. I never know which case it's going to be, but I know it's going to be a case. And if I've, if I've packed the center too tight and then I lose utilization due to those canceled cases, uh, I can never make that time up and I'm going to be short ORs. So we use the 75% target. Uh, that's what I've used for complex multi-specialty surgical centers for 30 years. Uh, and the same thing on the inpatient side, uh, we've, we've used that 75% target. Uh, and it's also a target that we've seen uh, used frequently by uh, other modelers and also to align well with, with well-run departments. Uh, you can run a few percentage points over 75 for a while, but typically that sticking with that 75% is a, is a, a safe, achievable, uh, financially viable target. And next page. So finally, uh, we compared that against uh, an outside uh, Vizient did a study uh, for the UVMMC after we put all of our modeling together. And as we looked at OR utilization and we looked at room turnaround times, uh, the UVMMC's actual performance and the numbers that we used uh, in the going go, kind of the go forward model uh, fell between the 50 and the 50th and 75th percentile uh, for the other similar academic medical centers that we were looking at. So we felt, you know, comfortable and vindicated, I guess, that, you know, we, we'd chosen wisely. Uh, we had reasonable targets that, that are a, a good balance of, of achievable, providing adequate clinical capacity, but also being responsible stewards of, uh, of our resources. Um, Eve, back, back to you. Thank you, Scott. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. So this table summarizes um, the work that we did um, on, on the forecast modeling. So again, um, the first column scenario three shows our estimates in 2021 that formed the basis for um, the facility planning um, of the OSC that you'll hear about in a few minutes. Um, again, that 22% growth in surgeries um, to 2030, um, to bring you bring it home with a number, results in 23,800 or around um, surgeries in, in 2030. That's about 4,000 more um, than we do today. Um, with the HALSA um, OR model, um, that, that um, volume translates into the need for 5.6, or we better round up, um, six more um, operating rooms um, than we have today. And because um, we are assuming that we are closing down the outdated Fannie Allen ORs. Um, it told us that we would need 10.6 or 11 ORs in this outpatient surgery center. If we fast forward to, to the most recent kind of revised um, forecast based on SG2 um, and the 2024 Claritas model, we get about 1,900 to 1,000 fewer um, forecast surgeries um, by 2030. So remember, um, so, so again, that um, 17 to 22 percent growth um, results in about one OR's worth, if you think about plus minus um, difference in the number of surgeries that need to happen um, by 2030. Using Mathematica's um, uh, model for um, forecasting the number of ORs needed. Um, their model suggests that it's six more incremental um, operating rooms needed to handle that 22,800 surgeries, um, which brings us to um, 11 ORs needed um, in the OSC. Okay, and with that, I am going to turn it over to, um, I don't know if it's to you, Dr. Leffler, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting, but I believe it is, to introduce the next section. Thank you so much, Eve. Next, we're gonna hear from Eve again, Beth Sanu, and Dr. Coleman discussing the 
of this project for our patients, providers, and to meet our DEI objectives. Great, thank you. Um, can I get slide 10, Marie, please? Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Beth Sunyu, the Network Director of Planning, Design, and Construction um, for the Health Network. The site for the proposed outpatient surgery center was strategically selected to be accessible, convenient, and familiar to achieve the best patient and provider experience. It was chosen after a careful analysis of location, proximity to our medical center's main campus, adjacent pedestrian and public transportation access, proximity to utility infrastructure, and the site's capacity to meet initial construction size requirements, as well as future growth needs. UVM Medical Center currently holds a purchase option for this property. The proposed lot is 13.5 acres, located on the northern side of Tilly Drive in South Burlington. This is 3.3 miles from the main campus in Burlington. Only 10 of our 13.5 acres of this property will be developed as part of this project. The site, as you can see from the map, is adjacent to UVM Medical Center's outpatient clinics on Tilly Drive, including orthopedics, cardiology, cardiac rehab, pain management, ambulatory infusion, and soon to be dermatology and ophthalmology, which will be opening in fall of 24. Uh, this location in South Burlington is served by enhanced public transportation system and will have connectivity to a newly constructed rec path, which will extend into the O'Brien Farm housing development to the north. Um, slide 11, please. The site design for this project includes 270 on-site parking spaces for staff, patient, and visitors on the west and north sides of the building. The site slopes from west to east, allowing for at-grade access to the lower level of the building for back-of-house deliveries and staff access to the building. Patient and visitor access will be through the drop-off canopy and the main entrance on the west side of the building. Landscaping elements on the site include screening of abutting properties and in parking islands. Two elevated berms will provide additional screening near the adjacent residential properties. A small exterior patio on the south side of the building will be provided for patients and families, and our staff will have access to an outdoor area on the north side of the building. Site utilities for include electrical service from Green Mountain Power, natural gas, and we'll have two water lines serving the building, uh, one for main service to the building and one for a fire department connection on the western side. Gravel stormwater wetlands will be constructed on the eastern portion of the site, and out back will be an exterior oxygen farm to provide medical gas to the surgical center. Permit applications for the project site plan, water allocation, wastewater allocation have all been filed with the city of South Burlington. A zoning permit for this project was issued in November of 22, and the project has also received our Act 250 approval from the state. At this time, I'll turn it over to Thomas Morris from E4H to dive deeper into the building design. Good morning, I'm Thomas Morris with E4H. I'm a principal in this office. Uh, we're the architectural design team for this project. I'm gonna go over the, the plans. As Beth mentioned, the site allows an entrance at grade level on the lower level. And it also allows an entrance on the upper level on the west side of the of the plan. So if you go to the next page, actually, let me just talk about this one a little bit, because I think it's it's better to look at this than the floor plan. In addition to the site plan specifics that Beth went over, there's going to be a drop off and a pickup on the west side of the project coming in off Tilly Drive. So you'll approach the building. You'll drive underneath a drop off canopy. You'll be able to drop patients off to, to proceed into the building. You'll also be able to pick up patients after they've had service, and then you'll be able to exit the, the campus. Parking is going to be primarily to the north for staff, and then we've kind of uh, congregated the patient parking and visitor parking closer to the entrances for ease of access to the front of the building. 
Um, so the red arrow is the discharge, the green arrow is the entrance, and the blue arrow around the back is employee entrance. Um, go to the next slide, which is the lower level. Okay, well, well, this is the upper level. So as I mentioned, the green arrow is the entrance. You will come in at the ground floor and your admin will be in that area. There'll also be check-in for patient arrival and there'll be a waiting area in that tan area. Um, adjacent to that is the outdoor patio that Beth mentioned. Um, there's consult spaces for a physician and um, patient uh, discussions in that waiting area as well. So once you've checked in, you will proceed to pre-op. You can see the green arrow indicating the path of travel to pre-op. We have 12 pre-op stations set up for patient arrival and preparation for surgery. Once you've gone through pre-op, you'll go into the OR area. You can see the green area indicates the eight ORs that were designated for the project now. The gray area to the south are the four future ORs. Once you've had your procedure, you will start to move through recovery. The first one is stage one recovery, where we have 14 bays established. Once you've established pass through stage one recovery, you'll move through stage two recovery, um, where you will then be discharged. In addition to the stage two recovery, we do have the eight 23 hour uh, uh, patient rooms um, for patients that need to stay over overnight. Um, if you go to the next page, this is the lower level. So this is primarily for staff entrance and shipping and receiving is all down at this lower area. Um, in addition to the staff support spaces on the lower level, we have the obvious spaces down there, um, engineering, there's a bunch of mechanical spaces, um, electrical rooms. The staff locker rooms are located in this area as well. And there is a staff classroom on this uh, floor near the entrance. But the biggest probably functioning space down here is the central sterile processing, which is directly below the ORs. So we have good vertical connectivity between um, bringing clean instruments up to the surgical floor, as well as dirty case cards down for uh, sterilizations and processing. Uh, you can see the red boxes indicate vertical transportation from the lower level to the upper level. Um, so we have things that align and stack very nicely with this given plan. And I think the next image is just an architectural rendering of what the building looks like. So this is the northeast view at the drop off. So you can see the set of double doors that, that are closest to you. Those would be where patients arrive. Um, they're dropped off underneath the covered walkway. They proceed into the building, go through the check in process. A little bit further to the right, you can see the um, patient patio that, that uh, uh, Beth spoke about. And a little bit in the background is the drop off. So arrival and under covered, uh, covered approaches. Next image is kind of a straight on view um, looking east at the main part of the building. And again, this is the covered drop off area for discharge and um, arrival. Uh, that's pretty much it for the architectural overview of the lower level and upper levels. Beth, do you know who's going to speak next? Is it Dr. Uh, Coleman? Dr. Coleman is going to Okay, I just wanted to make sure. So it's been, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to speak about the um, health equity and DEI considerations um, for the outpatient surgery center. Health equity and DEI um, principles were considered in the project design. The facility will include gender neutral restrooms and changing areas and private lactation areas. 
design elements to support um, the patient privacy. So patient pre-op and recovery rooms are separated by walls and no longer curtains. They have a separate entry and exit doors as well. Additionally, patients who have communication access needs or may have uh, additional needs will be identified in the pre-assessment screening and testing process, which allows time to secure appropriate resources to accommodate the patient. Notably, there's direct uh, interpreted call-in lines um, represented in 31 languages and on-call ASL interpreters for all sites through a third-party vendor, and that's available 24-7. I want to note that the uh, pre-assessment screening and testing process also identifies any transportation needs, and throughout that process are patients who may need to use public transport or uh, um, additional uh, transportation support, and um, that will be identified so that the, assess the appointment um, can be scheduled to align with the schedule uh, availability of different transportation options. The project as a whole promotes health care equity by preserving local access to care. Insufficient local capacity will have the greatest negative impact on our lower income patients and those that cannot afford to travel to receive care elsewhere. We know that when people don't receive care close to home, the burden of the lack of access really falls disproportionately on our low income and least advantaged Vermonters, including our members of our refugee, immigrant, and BIPOC communities, as well as those living with a disability or our older adult, adult Vermonters, as mentioned earlier. If you do have means and you can't get timely care here, then you are able to travel to Boston or Albany or Dartmouth, even though it costs you and our system more. And if you are um, financially restrained or lack transportation and you wait, sometimes you suffer while you wait, that result is not just, and this project will help address that injustice. There are additional questions towards at the end of our presentation about this. Um, I'm happy to answer those. We're gonna Thank turn you, back to Beth Sinu um, briefly for one uh, more comment. Sure, yeah, I just wanted to add um, our design process from start to finish has had extensive input um, from our, our doctors, our registered nurses, um, our design team, as well as our patient and family advocates. Um, this is a process that we do on all of our projects. Um, we like to get input from all sides of the all sides of the table um, to provide the best facilities for our patients and community. I will turn it now, I think, back to Eve or Mary or Dr. Leffler. <laughs> Actually, we'll turn back to Dr. Leffler to introduce the next speakers. Thank you, Karen. Our next speakers will speak to staffing the new outpatient center. That will be Chris Dillon and Mary Broadworth. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, if you can put the slides back up, number 17 um, shows in a pretty basic table format how we're looking at recruitment from the provider and learner perspective uh, for the next phase of the, the first phase of the OSC. You can see here uh, for the Department of Anesthesiology, we're looking at adding 1.2 physician FTEs and four APP FTEs to help staff the incremental rooms. Here, the Department of Surgery, we refer to generally, uh, and this captures the Department of Surgery per se, orthopedics and OBGYN. And we heard as recently as Thursday this past week, that we have surgeons in those departments still actively looking for incremental block time. Block time, which I'm sure we'll talk more about later, is predictable recurring pieces of OR time allocated to specific services or providers. And we do not have more of that to provide in current state. We're currently um, finding incremental OR time in the nooks and crannies of our OR schedule. And so we believe that the current physician cadre can expand into this new access to provide more access for patients. So this is the provider and learner perspective, uh, and I will turn it over to Mary to speak about other components of our staffing. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mary Broadworth. I'm the Vice President of Human Resources for the Medical Center. Um, if we can go to slide 18, I would like to share with you um, how we plan for the staffing model. Um, to develop this plan, uh, we look at benchmarks. 
Um, we use the American Society of Peri Anesthesia Nursing Benchmarks for peri anesthesia staffing and the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses Benchmark for our operating room staffing. The eight operating room OSC will require 107 full-time equivalents and 57.5 of those will be new direct staff hires. Um, as we've discussed earlier, we anticipate uh, our portion of our current employees will move over and we will have uh, this new group to hire. When the two additional operating rooms open, uh, we'll need an additional 18 full-time equivalents. In our modeling, we assume that 25% of the operating room registered nurses are full-time equivalents, 10% of our surgical tech FTEs, and 10% of our parent anesthesia RNs will be uh, traveling or contracted employees. The eight operating rooms will require 15 full-time equivalent additional ancillary staff or indirect staff uh, to ha help manage the process in the building. And 10 operating rooms will require two additional FTEs. We've implemented um, many initiatives to support workforce recruitment across the medical center and the UVM Health Network. We've done many things to enhance our talent acquisition program or staffing and sourcing, um, our marketing to empl potential employees through our career website, um, and expedited our application process so to remove barriers for those trying to get in touch with us for opportunities. And for most of our positions, we have some sort of hiring incentive. Um, we have a referral bonus for our employees, as well as some sign-on bonuses for um, positions where we have a high need. In workforce development, um, we've got a study stipend for LNAs uh, who work part-time while enrolled in an RN degree program and agree to work for us uh, for up to two years. So these are our Vermont Agency of Health Services Accelerated BSN Pathway Program, our Vermont Agency of Health Services Master's in Nursing Pathway Program, and we have several in-house programs, including our Surgical Technical Pathways Program. And in addition, we know um, a challenge for potential employees moving to the area is employee housing and child care, and we are investing in both of those. Just to share our recent experience, um, we have a net growth of 120 new nurses, uh, our LPNs and RNs in the last 18 months into the organization. And we are experiencing lower than average RN turnover, 6% uh, projected for this year versus a 17% average in the Northeast. And we are starting to convert our travelers to full-time staff. Uh, we've had 21 uh, recently hired in the last year, um, deciding to stay with us full time. In workforce development, um, we've talked about our um, programs to enhance education. We've had 44 students uh, participate in the LNA to RN program, eight in that accelerated, um, uh, the accelerated BSN program, and 21 in the um, MSN Pathways program. So thank you for your time this morning. I'll turn it back to Steve. Thank you so much, Mary and Chris. Next, we're gonna discuss the financials of the project. And so we're gonna hear from Rick Vincent, Mark Stanislaus, and Eve Hoare. I will kick us off. Thank you very much. Um, and we're going to go right to the capital expense summary, please. So next slide. Thanks, Marie. Great. Um, so um, th this is a high level table of the capital costs of the project. Um, you can see that 90, $94 million has been allocated to construction. Um, given the uh, inflation that we were seeing um, as we were developing the plan on capital costs, uh, excuse me, on construction costs, um, I want to note that the construction estimate includes a 20% contingency. 
um, which is significantly higher than contingencies that we had we've used um, historically. Land acquisition costs are approximately $5 million. Um, our equipment budget is $22 million. That includes a 10% contingency um, in, that, in that category, um, as well as in IT, where the um, estimated IT costs for this project are about $1.6 million. So before capitalized interest, it makes the entire the total project cost one point uh, excuse me one hundred and twenty three million dollars, um, and then with the six point three million dollars of capitalized interest, um, makes our grand total one hundred and twenty nine point six million dollars. Um, a note on the equipment list. Um, these costs are high, it includes, um, but it includes about um, $1.7 million in, um, uh, to support equipment needed in our CSR unit. Um, a quick note that we um, hired a number of experts to see if we could use the CSR area in the main campus um, to, to uh, do the instrument sterilization for the outpatient surgery center, and we could save money in that way. Um, we consulted with two experts, and both of them came back and said, do not do that for, um, for a number of great reasons. Uh, and so um, we, we made the decision to include the space and the cost of having that central sterile um, space um, and instrumentation right right here on site. Um, I think it can serve as a backup should anything happen to Central Sterile at the main campus. Um, and nice to have that redundancy um, for um, for and that's so critical um, to the um, to the functioning of of the UVM Medical Center as a whole. Great. We can go on um, to next slide, please. I'm going to bring this forward to the pro forma. I'll start and then pass it over to both Rick and Mark. So you've seen um, our pro forma in our CON application, um, and we've discussed the pro forma at length in the rounds of questions since then. So I'll give you a high level overview here. Um, the incremental patient revenue that you see here um, it has three components in it. So it has so let, actually, let me step back and talk about an incremental pro forma. So while it may make sense to some, it may, it, I think it's important to talk about what this is and what this isn't to everyone here. So we're charged with helping our leaders understand the incremental additional financial impact of this project on the financials of the UVM Medical Center. So we look at incremental revenue or reimbursement actually, and incremental expense from doing this project. So it ties into the volumes that you saw before, it ties to the capital um, and the staffing plan um, for, the, for the project and where we bring it all together. So I'll talk about um, this incremental pro forma. We also submitted um, a full OSC project pro forma um, with our CON submission to answer the question as its own entity, does, does the OSC provide, what's the impact or what's the contribution of the OSC as its own entity to the financials um, of the UVM Medical Center? All right, so back to this incremental pro forma, three components to um, the incremental patient revenue. The first is um, incremental outpatient um, volumes from incremental outpatient volumes that we can um, that we can achieve here at the outpatient surgical center. The second component is incremental inpatient volumes from that um, from that incremental uh, inpatient volume growth that we projected to 2030 that we can't accommodate now. Um, given our OR capacity um, and our current volumes. And then the third component of uh, incremental inpatient revenue was an adjustment for those cases, outpatient cases, which we now do either at the main campus or Fannie Allen that are shifting to the outpatient surgery center and will, um, and will be reimbursed at a lower rate, um, either through our Medicare 
reimbursement or through lower commercial reimbursement. And so that's the incremental patient revenue line that you see there. On the expense line, we have incremental um, salaries and wages that we're paying to, um, pursuant to the, cap, the staffing costs that you just heard about. Um, the salary wage and other line also includes some incremental um, surgeon compensation based on the additional um, surgeries that um, they will be doing on the outpatient basis. Uh, other department operating expense includes medical, pharmacy, and surgical supplies. Um, it also includes some startup expenses for making this, shutting down the FANI ORs and making this transition um, to the outpatient surgery center. Other non-department operating expense um, includes um, the, health, the Vermont healthcare provider tax. The next line shows direct costs for incremental, the incremental inpatient cases. That includes um, incremental um, compensation um, um, or incremental hiring needed for, um, for physicians to take care of those um, inpatient cases, as well as incremental um, uh, staffing, staffing associated with that. And then we have the depreciation and interest line. So as you can see, our incremental operating margin after we subtract depreciation and interest expense yields a $28.2 million five-year um, margin total. From an earnings before interest depreciation and amortization um, standpoint, um, our five-year EBITDA is $83.2 million. Okay, and with that, I will turn it over to Rick. Thank you. Or maybe it's Mark. No, I think it's me. Good morning, I'm Rick Vincent. I'm the CFO of the UVM Health Network. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the project fits into the overall financial framework. Uh, for those of you on the board, I think you've seen our framework um, uh, multiple times, uh, we we present this as part of our budget narrative every year. It's the it's the metrics that guides our uh, finances for the for the UVM Medical Center. Um, so one operating EBITDA margin um, is the margin that we where we generate cash from our core operations. So it's the operating margin minus all the non cash related items. For us, we're a nonprofit organization, so anything that we generate um, in terms of operating even a margin, we turn back into the organization as reinvestment um, in, uh, in patient care and taking care of our communities. Uh, debt to capitalization ratio, so what this tells us is are we borrowing too much money or do we have actually some capacity to potentially borrow some additional uh, funds to help support uh, our patients and our uh, communities. Uh, days cash on hand tells us um, whether or not we have enough resources to reinvest in the organization and also be able to absorb um, uh, downturns in our business. Uh, we, need, we need enough of a reserve there to, to be able to, uh, to take on unexpected uh, events. And then the last line, average age of plant, uh, that tells us, are we reinvesting in the organization um, at a fast enough um, pace um, to ensure that we're, we're meeting the needs of our, uh, of our communities? All of those metrics, so operating EBITDA margin, uh, what highlights a healthy A-rated organization is an operating EBITDA margin that's in the seven to 9% range. Uh, debt to capitalization, um, you want to be uh, somewhere in the 30 to 40 percent range. Days cash on hand, 150 is the minimum. Um, you actually, um, based on A-rated organizations, need to be closer to 200. Uh, and then finally, average age of plant, um, uh, a healthy organization, uh, that, that, that ratio is between 11 and 13 uh, percent, which shows that you're you're reinvesting at a uh, at a healthy uh, pace. You can see that this the numbers that you see here, uh, the projection years actually includes what Eve just went through in terms of how this um, how this project fits within our overall framework. Um, 
It includes the, the operating EBITDA margin, includes the 83 million that we're projecting. So it does have a positive uh, impact uh, on that. In terms of days cash on hand, uh, we will see a small uh, decrease of about three days in that first half year uh, of operating the OSC. And that's driven by the fact that, um, as you, I think you saw on uh, a couple slides prior, the total project cost for the OSC is $130 million, but we're only planning to borrow $100 million. So we're going to act, we're going to be using $30 million of that. Uh, that day's cash on hand reserve to to fund the project in the first um, the first half year, but then from then on um, the the project adds about two days cash on hand uh, per year uh, based on that operating uh, EBITDA margin. And then finally, um, I think the last point just to to highlight here that even with this investment, um, you can see that the average age of plant is still climbing. Um, towards that higher end of that metric. Uh, we want to be within 13 there, um, but we do, when we get out to those uh, those uh, future years, uh, we do have a little bit more debt capacity. So in 2024, uh, we're at 24.8%, uh, which uh, we could, in theory, get up to 30%, um, but we want to make sure that uh, these are obviously projections, so we want to make sure we're actually generating uh, these types of operating EBITDA margins in the in the years ahead, and that our cash does continue to to climb. Uh, because as you can see, we we saw a significant decline in 2022 from the uh, the severe impact of the the workforce crisis um, and the the large sums of money that we had to pay uh, for uh, for contract uh, labor and other other items. So with that, I think um, I'm kicking this back to Dr. Leffler. Thank you, Rick and Eve. Next, we're going to hear from our providers. First up is you're going to hear from Dr. Plant again, the importance of this project. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Steve. Sorry for round two of me. Um, I Again, want to thank you sincerely for the opportunity to give another perspective, and I'm now going to use the lens of um, training people and what it means to our community. So the backdrop on that is, um, so I'm part of the faculty at UVM. I've been the residency program director for urology since the reestablishment of residency training over a decade ago. What this has meant for our community is that we actually have four urologic faculty that have been recruited to stay in the area, where without that residency training program, we, we probably would have more of a shortage of urologists. This is not about urology, this is about every specialty, because that same narrative exists across all our specialties, whether surgical or non-surgical. But when we talk about surgical service delivery, then we're talking about, so the carpenters need tools. And those tools are forever changing and they're actually changing at a rate that is more rapid. Um, we, we know that technologic advancement is more rapid today than it ever has been. So we're talking about robotics. We're talking about different types of cardiothoracic surgery. We're talking about endovascular procedures. So the reinvestment in terms of the uh, backdrop of the operative arenas is um, forever necessary and actually again, uh, more acutely needed than ever. In terms of the OSC, specifically and granularly, what does it mean? It means that our operative need on the main campus for very specific and very complicated procedures uh, means we need to decant a lot of the volume to an outpatient surgery center. A decantation that, as you've heard, is not possible with the Fanny Allen. So hence a newer space will allow for us to decant procedures that don't need to be on the main campus and then allow us to better accommodate on the main campus the more complex procedures. So veritably it is a very, very important interdigitation of the more complex with the less complex for the needs of our community. I will be redundant and say again, we're not a nip and tuck institution. A lot of the surgeries we're talking about are indeed cardiac Neuro neurosurgical, complicated ENT, complicated urology. 
a lot of cancer surgeries, and an incredible plethora of orthopedic procedures as well. Again, and again, to be not duplicative, but necessarily duplicative um, in my statement, we have an aging population that brings with it a higher level of complexity of disease and a higher level of need for surgical um, treatment. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Plant. Next up, we're gonna hear from Dr. Claude Nichols, who's the Network Department Chair, Orthopedics and Rehab Medicine. Good morning, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, I've been at the uh, University of Vermont Medical Center for the past 39 years, at the extent of my career. I've been Network Chair for the past 25 years. And you know the the issue of of surgical access has has always been an, uh, kind of paramount. Um, as other speakers have stated, the issue of block time is is critical. And one of the things that that we've discovered in recent uh, months, uh, due to some calculations by one of my colleagues, is that the orthopedic surgeons uh, aren't working up to their capacity. You know, we have the ability to do many more cases than we are doing right now. And some of that's because of the availability of OR time and uh, meaning block time. And some of it is, is due to the fact that doing outpatient procedures in an inpatient setting is just not an efficient way to deliver care to patients. Um, you know, uh, the typical orthopedic practice around the country is uh, orthopedic surgeons working in the operating room two to three days a week um, and and having teams that are, uh, you know, designed to help them expedite the, the volume of cases so that the patients in their communities can be taken care of. And unfortunately, in, in, in our community, that's not the case. Um, you know, it's we do have the ability to to uh, run to uh, to have surgeons work two days a week, but that's not across the board. We have backlogs in many areas that we've been able to work on through some special programs that we've introduced. But you know, the area, the, our problem are our problems are the 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 resources in terms of rooms and also um, the things that are available. Uh, with the uh, outpatient surgery centers, meaning specialty anesthesia, specialty nursing care, designed to help expedite the the, the cases through the system. Um, in terms of you know the uh, aging population and outpatients, uh, you know as as Dr. Plant just alluded to, um, the complexity is increasing over time, and it's not just the older population that, that's being more complex. It's just we have a younger population who are requiring procedures that used to be relegated to an older population, such as total joint replacement. You know, total joint replacement now is being done in patients under 50 years old and they're healthy and they can be done in an outpatient setting. But to do them effectively and efficiently, the, uh, an outpatient surgery center you know, you know, uh, provides the resources in terms of nursing, anesthesia, uh, CSR, and all the other things that allow us to uh, to to move cases through the system. Um, you know, and if you look at a lot of the data, the SG2 data that uh, has been uh, evaluated, uh, the 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 primary growth area in orthopedics is now total joint replacement, given the growing the older population and also the younger population whose joints are just wearing out. And, you know, patients really want to have these issues done uh, in, a, in a way that's most conducive to their lifestyles, which means going home same day surgery for the, for, for the most part. And it's not just total joints, it's other issues like rotator cuff surgery, spine surgery. Spine surgery is becoming much more uh, uh, common in the outpatient setting, um, e even to doing the extent of uh, more complex cases of one and two level fusions. Um, the types of procedures that would be done at the outpatient surgery center from an orthopedic perspective would be total joints, meaning total hips, knees, and shoulders. Um, pretty much all the sports medicine cases, foot and ankle, upper extremity, and uh, you know spine uh, procedures that uh, don't require uh, the resources that the inpatient setting could provide. If you look at what would be done at the medical center, 
um, it would it would be a very limited uh, menu, meaning uh, trauma for the most part, complex revision total joints, and uh, you know you know complex spine, and also patients who have medical comorbidities that just don't allow them to be done in an outpatient setting, and so. You know, given that, there would be a huge offloading of, of, of patients from the inpatient setting and opening up the resources of the medical center for those patients who are critically ill, uh, who have cancers and other issues that, that need to be addressed in a timely fashion. Um, you know, one of the advantages of an outpatient surgery center uh, in 2023 is the advantage of doing, uh, you know, total joint replacement. Um, you know, you know, this is like a broken record, but uh, if you look around the country, total joint replacement in, on an outpatient set basis is becoming much, much more common. Um, the Fannie Allen cannot accommodate that. The rooms are small. Uh, the error uh, handling systems are not adequate. Um, and there's no capacity for a 23-hour stay at the Fannie. And albeit, we admit, not in an outpatient surgery center, not all patients will go home the same day. There will be a small, very small percentage who might need to to, to uh, stay 23 hours, and and but the FANI does not have that luxury at this point. And so having an outpatient surgery center that's designed for that kind of, of for that kind of contingency would be very, very important. Um, as far as the teaching mission, you know, one of the things that we found over time is that medical students want to go to uh, medical schools that offer uh, kind of state-of-the-art uh, facilities. And, you know, if you don't, uh, right now in 2023, outpatient surgery centers are state-of-the-art. Um, most hospitals, most med academic medical centers, most community hospitals have available to them uh, outpatient surgery centers. And, it, you know, if you can't attract the medical students, it will become more difficult to attract residents. You know, one of the interesting things about our residency program is that it is a national program. We have patients from the Pacific Northwest, from the Southwest, from the Southeast, New England, Midwest. And so, um, you know, we attract residents from all over the country, given the, 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 the nature of our program. Um, you know, we have a very competitive program at, at the University of Vermont. And we want it to stay that way as we want all the surgical, you know, surgical all the surgical programs to, to remain highly competitive. And the only way we can do that is by, you know, training residents in an environment that they will be facing as they go out into the real world and work. And if we can't, if we can't provide them with that type of experience, then, you know, the, the, the next domino that falls is the fact that they will no longer seek us out as, as, uh, uh, the, 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 residency education site that they would choose. So that, and if you look around the state of Vermont, um, there are many of our graduates who are staffing uh, a lot of the community hospitals in the area. And so we are a conduit, you know, for the musculoskeletal care for the state of Vermont. And so if you, know, if you want to go backwards, if, if we don't have an outpatient surgery center that can train people in a way that's state of the art, we're going to stop, you know, um, being able to attract those quality residents who stay in our state to provide care to our citizens. And so, you know, this is a very important project and I and I hope that you will consider it in a favorable way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Next, we're gonna hear from Dr. Heather Harrington, who's the Network Division Chief of Otolaryngology. Thank you, Steve. Um, <clears throat> so, like you said, my name is Heather Harrington. I'm the leader of otolaryngology, or as most people call us, ENT for the network. Um, and today I'd like to speak from two different lenses, and, and I apologize, I will echo a lot of the things that Dr. Plant and Dr. Nichols already said. Um, but I wanna speak first as leader of ENT for our network, and then also from the perspective of a pediatric um, provider in pediatric ENT. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, cause not everyone um, is totally clear on what ENT does. Um, we're a subspecialty that's mostly made up of outpatient and short-stay surgical cases. So we take care of a really wide range of patients, from babies to the elderly. And we have a very diverse surgical practice. Um, we do everything from placing ear tubes, which is the most common surgical procedure in the country, um, to cochlear implants, to restore and establish hearing for patients. We do 
you know, things like tonsillectomy that are super simple, but also robotic cancer resections and microvascular flea, excuse me, free flap reconstructions. Um, and while our complex airway and head and neck cancer cases need to be performed at the main OR for the post-op ICU care, you know, a lot of our straightforward head and neck cancer cases even, um, our sinus surgeries, our ear surgeries, and most of our thyroid and parathyroid surgeries can all be performed as outpatient or short stay cases at an OFC. So um, like Dr. Nichols said, our problem isn't that we don't have enough surgeons um, and we certainly have plenty of patients, but our wait times aren't acceptable. You know, even though the majority of our patients can be done as an outpatient in a setting that's more efficient, um, not delayed by bumps and emergent cases in the main OR, uh, we don't have the geography for that. We don't have the, the OR space for it. Um, so this means that things that could be done as an outpatient are taking up space uh, in the main OR that could be used for our complex patients that do need ICU care. It also means that for a lot of patients who can afford it and have the means, they leave the area to have these procedures done. They go to Dartmouth or Boston or Albany and they get it done much faster. Um, but we also know that many of our patients can't do that. You know, our patients with the most limited resources um, end up with the poorest access to care. I know that the board already has access to your wait times and data, but just to sort of dial it down, I wanna give you a very specific example. If you were to come into our clinic today, be recommended to have an ear surgery, you know, to fix a hole in an eardrum, you know, help with hearing or a non-cancerous ear tumor, today, you would be booked into at least October for that surgery. And so, you know, for adults, that's a dissatisfier. Um, it isn't great for quality of life, but it's not critical. Where it really hurts us is when you look at young kids who have hearing loss, who need ear tubes, who are in the period of critical speech and language acquisition, this puts those kids at risk for speech delay and, you know, imparts problems throughout childhood and into school age that then fall in our school systems and um, impact our communities in different ways. So, you know, initially an OSC would move adult outpatient cases from the main hospital and increase access for our complex patients uh, at the main OR. Eventually it would also allow access for pediatric patients as we're able to move pediatric cases there. Um, so just to sort of uh, conclude, I have to say from my perspective, you know, for ENT, it's not the latest uh, and greatest technology and flashiest space that we need, but we're not able to provide basic surgical care to our population right now. Um, we aren't able to ensure that our most at-risk patients have access to the care that they need. And we care about this as a group because we don't feel like we're giving adequate care to our patients. One of my um, best mentors, who's one of our most flexible, creative surgeons, who's been here for many, many years, says this is the worst care that he's ever provided to our patients, just for an, an access standpoint. And so um, you know, this is just about patients. This isn't about our trainees. Certainly an issue for ENT, just like it is for orthopedics from a trainee standpoint. Um, but if we don't fix this access issue, it's gonna become quickly compounded in the next years. Um, and we're gonna have, you know, a situation where we don't feel like we're practicing in Vermont in 2024, but feel like we're really, you know, triaging patients like it's the third world. So thank you for um, listening to my perspective. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. Next, we have Dr. Haley Reist, who's a fifth year orthopedic resident. Orthopedic resident. Thanks, Dr. Leffler, for having me. Uh, so I'm Haley Reist. I'm one of the uh, fifth year residents in orthopedics. I'll be graduating in just a few months and going up to Colorado to start a fellowship in total joint replacement surgery. Uh, and when choosing total joint replacement surgery for my, my career, because these surgeries make such a great difference on the patient's lives, especially at a time in their lives where mobility is key to their continued function independence. And these surgeries dramatically reduce pain and improve function, improve function under surgery. You know, not years down the line, but days, weeks, and months down the line. Um, and when considering options for fellowship location, the presence of an outpatient surgery center really did play into my decision. And the center I'll be training at in Colorado does <clears throat> utilize actually a couple different outpatient surgery center locations. Center location. uh, and this piece of total joint replacement training is actually key as more and more places across the country and more and more surgeries across the country are being performed in this setting. 
as Dr. Nichols had mentioned. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to attend many orthopedic meetings across the country, both general orthopedics and total joint replacement specific meetings. And there have been a major focus on of these meetings on the drastic increase that these procedures have been performed in outpatient surgery center. Every meeting has at least a few different slideshows and um, uh, talking points about outpatient surgery care. Um, and so this is the way care is now being provided for many patients, for many patients have that they can often lead to better patient care and provide it in a much more timely fashion. As a learner, it's essential to train in the setting that I'll be practicing in the future, just as Dr. Nichols had mentioned. For me, the clinical decision-making skills needed to determine it to determine are even appropriate for an OSC setting is crucial for me to gain as I need to be able to make that sound clinical decisions in my own practice in order to serve patients in a safe and efficient manner. Clinical decision, the increase in volume that does come with the utilization of an outpatient surgery center is also essential to learners like myself to have enough volume to be able to safely care for patients when we are out on our own in practice. And while I'm not sure where I will end up practicing, after practicing after, many medical students, residents, and fellows return to their training location. And just as Dr. Plant had mentioned, with urology, many orthopedic surgeons practice here, uh, both at the at the um, um, the and across the many of the orthopedic surgeons I work with did some portion or many much of their training here. And having an OSC will be a major attractor to many surgeons in the future, as they know they can provide better care to patients in this setting. Again, thanks for letting me provide my perspective, and happy for questions later. Thank you, Dr. East. And finally, we're going to hear from a patient who had total joint surgery um, in 2023, Susan Anderson. Thank you, and thank you for letting me speak with you this morning. Um, I wanted to be a patient at UVMC for hip replacement, but the wait was too long. Um, both the initial consultation took a little scheduling, and then the scheduling for the surgery. I was in a great deal of pain, so much so that I had to use a walker. And I was told it would be at least four months from the consultation time to schedule the surgery. I then tried Copley and was told the same thing. This forced me to go to Dartmouth Hitchcock, specifically. Alice Peck Day Hospital, where I had my first hip replacement in June of last year and my second hip replacement in December of last year. It was a long, painful ride in the car, and I had to do it at four times for each hip, asking my son to come from Singapore to help take me there. Um, it would have made a world of difference if I could have had this surgery here in Chittenden County at UVMC at an outpatient setting. I mentioned that I was treated at Alice Peck Day Hospital, which is quite reminiscent of an outpatient setting. It's very small. For those of us, that have to have work done, operations rather, um, we're in such pain. Going to a main campus setting can add stress for parking, for getting there, getting in and out. An outpatient setting is much more common. I was much calmer going to a very small setting at Alice Peck Day. Also, I want to mention that after my first hip replacement, I was needed to stay overnight for some mild complications. They released me the next day, but it was very nice to be there in a quiet, small setting. And then I was well enough to go home the next day. I can't emphasize enough what it would mean 
to have an outpatient setting. Once we're in pain, it's moments are critical to us. Time is critical and four month waits seem unfathomable. Thank you and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. And I actually want to apologize on behalf of the UVM Medical Center. We failed you. And there's many, many other patients that we could have that could give the same devastating story. We are not getting all the patients scheduled as quickly as they need to be scheduled. You heard from our providers. You've heard from our patients that this project is critical. I started with this presentation with we know that we have access challenges. We take them extremely seriously. We have staffing challenges, equipment challenges, space challenges. This project, the Outpatient Surgery Center, is a key piece of addressing our space challenges to get more people surgery in a timely fashion and a setting that makes sense for them and our providers. We're proud of this project. This project is all about our patients. So we'll stop with our formal presentation there and we're happy to take questions. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you all. Um, I think at this point it would be good to take a 10 minute break, reconvene at 10.52 um, and we'll go to any questions the interested parties might have uh, and then to board questions. Does that sound good? Yeah. Hearing Thank Officer you. Barber, just one one request. Ms. Anderson, who just spoke, is not able to return for the afternoon portion of the hearing. So if there are any questions for her, it would be great if they could be asked right away. And that may be the case for some of the physicians who spoke as well, um, Dr. Nichols, Dr. Harrington, Dr. Reist, and Dr. Plant. Yes, you did email me about that. Um, I did. And I forgot. Uh, yes, that makes sense. Um, so, um, still think a 10 minute break. Ms. Anderson, if you could, are you able to stick with us for 10 minutes? Yep, I will be happy. Okay. And then we'll um, take any questions there may be for those witnesses. Could you just say, say their names one more time so I have it? Sure. So, Ms. Anderson, um, mm -hmm. Claude Nichols, Dr. Claude Nichols, Dr. Mark Plant, Dr. Haley Reist, and Dr. Heather Harrington. Okay. Okay. So we'll thank you. Take, take a ten minute break. Uh, take any questions for those witnesses, and then excuse them, and then uh, move on to the other. Any other? Okay. Um, so next we'll. Uh, move to each interested party and board for any questions of um, the physicians, doctors Nichols, Plant, Reist, and Harrington. Does the Office of the Healthcare Advocate have any questions for those witnesses? We have questions, but not for those witnesses specifically. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Um, and AFT Vermont. Ms. Snell, do you have any questions for these witnesses? We do not have any questions for those witnesses. Thank you. Um, Northwestern Medical Center, any questions for the physician witnesses? We do not have any questions for those witnesses. Thanks. Thank you. And Copley Hospital, any questions for those uh, four witnesses? Uh, no, not the physician witnesses. Thank you. Okay, and I'll move to the board. Um, Dr. Merman, do you have any questions for those witnesses? No, just appreciation for their coming today and the testimony. Thanks. And uh, board member Lunge. 
one question, which I, I'm not sure if it's best directed to the physician witnesses or not, so I'll ask it in case it is. Um, Dr. Leffler mentioned in his opening remarks um, that you, the medical center has been focused on uh, different ways to increase the surgical volume currently in order to maximize current capacity. And I think some of the physician who testified, and again, I want to echo Dr. Merman's appreciation, talked a little bit about some of the limitations of the current space. I'm wondering if anyone can just give a little more color commentary on the types of efforts that uh, you've been working on in order to maximize the current space. I, I guess I probably would be uh, one of the people that weigh in. So in, in terms of um, ways we, we increased our volumes, obviously reopening the Fannie was a huge one. Um, because that reinvigorated a lot of outpatient surgery that we just were not able to be providing. Uh, but then thereafter, it actually has been to um, run some rooms later during the day, which is very disruptive. And it's very difficult in terms of um, accommodating those emergencies you've heard about. Uh, the other things that we've done is we've created some ways to be more flexible in the schedule but again, that then starts competing with what you've heard about block time. People just do not have enough block time. So what that does is, as you've heard from everybody else, it just pushes all the other elective cases to be in longer wait lines. And I do also want to expound on one other thing. We are in a hyper competitive market for physicians, medical students, residents. Um, and, you know, we we do struggle with recruitment at times. So, again, and it, it is more specific to some specialties and specifically and especially orthopedics um, with respect to the idea that they they need the environment to do up to date surgery. Um, surgical center, you know, outpatient surgical centers are a standard of care across the nation. I hope that I, you know, I can delve into more detail if necessary, but again, thanks for providing audience. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Holmes, any questions for the four physicians? Nope. And um, Dr. Walsh? Thank you. A, a question for uh, Dr. Nichols, I believe. Uh, Dr. Nichols, uh, you nicely described the use of um, specialty teams, anesthesia uh, nurses um, who may focus on total joint replacements, for, for example. Um, are any of those teams functioning up and functioning now, or is that something that would be part of um, the new outpatient surgical center? Historically, we've had an, an orthopedically uh, dedicated uh, OR team. Um, during the pandemic, it disbanded just because of staffing issues. Um, the total joint group and the spine group both have uh, teams that they work with very closely who help uh, you know, move things along. So yes, those types of teams do exist in the present uh, scheme of things. How they're, not, they they're, not they're not perfect. They're not perfect, but they do exist. Right, I'm not chasing perfection by any means. Um, but how do they differ to what was in the teams that were in place pre-pandemic? Um, pre-pandemic, uh, we didn't have the same number of traveling nurses. We didn't have the same number of trainees. And so right now we're in the process of trying to uh, increase our OR staffing by having you know, surgical tech trainees work with us and having, uh, you know, nurses who uh, want to work in the operating room, learn how to uh, scrub and circulate. And so that that is different because we didn't have the same number of train uh, uh, ancillary trainees that that were learning as we go. And what we found is that, you know, that part of the growing process of training and increasing our uh, number of FTEs that we can that we need, uh, it slows us down a bit. And so the teams just aren't quite as efficient as they as they were. And they still have a number of travelers. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, thank you, and thank you to uh, everyone who's presented so far this morning. Noah, so before you go, could I just pop in or just with one more question for Dr. Nichols that I think actually might be more appropriate for him than for later, <clears throat> which is just you mentioned uh, about shifting cases uh, out of the inpatient setting to an outpatient setting. Um, and I'm trying to understand, do you think that those are changing from having patients as uh, outpatient cases at the main hospital campus? to the outpatient surgical center because of the capability of the operating rooms or actually less inpatient cases where patients have to be admitted after the case, shifting that to an outpatient environment? It's a combination of both. You're right now, uh, the, the spine service does not do any cases. Uh, well, they do some outpatient cases, um, but they don't do anything at, the, say, that the Fannie Allen Hospital. They, but the number of cases that they do as uh, outpatients is limited. Um, for the uh, uh, for the total joint service, um, you know, uh, the the trend uh, in 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 this time frame is uh, outpatient surgery for patients who are healthy and don't have medical comorbidities, and so. You know that that population is huge, and and the medical center just doesn't have the physical therapy facilities, the post-op nursing uh, acumen, to really make that happen on a regular basis. You know we we do it, but it has to be kind of choreographed ahead of time so that everyone is on board. It's not it's not the routine at this at this point. So do you envision? Um if the surgery center is built that you would then be able to have all the resources to uh, organized with the clinic nearby and the surgery center right there to have more patients uh, have outpatient total joints than you're currently having yes yes okay. yeah and and the other the other huge uh, issue with uh with uh the total joints is is post operative pain control i mean uh, that's been evolutionary over the past Five years or so that uh, you know we've been able to manage pain uh, such that patients don't need those inpatient stays, and so you know it's not just the efficiencies in the operating room. There are other aspects of our care that have been improved as well, um, and allow us to do outpatient, you know, more more invasive procedures as as outpatients. Thank you. If I could chime in around the anesthesia component of that question, especially as it relates to um, pain control, what Dr. Nichols was saying. So we actually, within our department, um, you can do additional training in anesthesiology and regional anesthesia. And not only do those pay, do those providers learn how to do um, the most advanced type of uh, nerve blocks that do treat the perioperative pain associated with orthopedic surgery, as part of that training, they also learn how to be very efficient and and that increases access to patients. And one of the issues that we have now with orthopedics being spread across both the main campus here and at the Fannie Allen is our limited number of experts in that field are spread too thin to really be able to maximize that efficiency as, as well as just the Fannie isn't really designed for that efficiency and having the outpatient surgery center will allow those experts to have the optimal work environment and the consolidation of patients to really, um, uh, you know, synergistically improve that efficiency and that and that pain control around orthopedic surgery. Thanks. Chair Foster, do you have any questions <clears throat> for these witnesses? I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll just throw it open one last time. Any board member questions for these four witnesses? Any any objection to me excusing them from the hearing for the rest of the day? All right. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks to you as well. And so now we'll move on to. Uh, questions from the interested parties and board members for um, it would be appropriate for the other witnesses. Um, 
<clears throat> I, if you can identify a witness, I think that would be preferable. But if not, um, I don't know if Karen or, or someone from UVMMC could kind of field the questions to the appropriate people. Um, Mike, I'll do my best. So if they're directed to one person, that's fine. If not, I'll I'll direct. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leffler. So we'll start with uh, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Sam Peich, it's a tough last name, spelled P-E-I-S-C-H from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Just want to thank uh, at the beginning everyone from the Medical Center for your presentation this morning and all your hard work and due diligence responding to questions from the board and from interested parties, um, both throughout the application and, and today. Um, so we have four questions today. I want to keep it brief because I know it's going to be a long day and they're organized in chronological order along with the redacted binder in case folks want to follow along. Hopefully that makes it a little bit easier. Um, so I think folks are all aware one of the conditions or requirements for CON approval is alignment with the health resource allocation plan. And one of those standards, 1.3, says, to the extent neighboring healthcare facilities provide the services proposed by the new healthcare project, an applicant shall demonstrate that a collaborative approach to delivering the service has been taken or is not feasible or appropriate. And in your response to the medical center, you wrote, an expansion of the surgical capacity will better allow UVMMC to continue to engage collaboratively with other providers with respect to their patient's care and avoid access constraints that make collaboration more difficult. So I'm, I, the reason I asked this, I'm wondering if you could provide a bit more detail about how creating this outpatient surgical center would better allow the medical center to engage collaboratively with other providers. So I'm going to start at a high clinical level, then I'm going to include Eve and Chris Dillon. So at a high level, I'm very confident that if you asked the leaders from Copley or Northwest Medical Center, one of the greatest challenges they face every day is making, making sure that when they want to transfer an ill patient to the medical center, we have a bed and capacity for them. It's a major issue across the state. We struggle every day to make sure we accept all patients who are truly sick and need tertiary care. The outpatient surgery center will help address that by moving some patients that are on campus now to the outpatient setting, by moving people who don't have to be admitted in the future to outpatient surgery, that'll help our capacity challenges. We work with our partner hospitals across the state every day. The projections that we use to build this model looked at only the patients that we're serving now in the geographic area we're serving now. It didn't envision taking patients from Northwest Medical Center or Copley, and we expect their populations to age and grow as well and need patient capacity. So I would say this project will free up some inpatient beds as we can do more cases than outpatients. And there's no easy way for us to send surgeons, surgical teams or equipment to other facilities that don't have the same electronic medical record, same scheduling tool, the same way to manage on-call schedules, or things that's very complicated for which really fractional capacity in their ORs. So I'll stop there. I'm sure you can give a more detailed response, but I wanted to make sure that at a high level, inpatient beds and OR capacity for critically ill patients across Vermont is really important. I do think this project is one piece, a small piece, but one piece of that work. Thank you. Eve? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Can you hear me OK? I, am I good? OK, great. Thanks, Sam. Um, Sam, I I don't, even though I, I have turned out to be one of the numbers people on this project, I want to say that this is like you heard it from the physicians here, but so much more than numbers and and all the little bits underneath um, really matter. So it it matters like where the growth is and where the inpatient growth is and where the outpatient growth is. And we're, if we're talking about complex surgeries or simple surgeries and so on and so forth. So. Um, so I, I would say that that number one, as Steve mentioned, we really we really, really want wanted to to be able to stand up and say we were only growing our own slice of the of the market share um, and felt like and, and it was a, that's both a pro and a con. Right. So we were expecting we were, were we were out of respect for our partners saying 
your market share will grow as well. And um, and, th- and now it's f- for you, for us together, whatever. For for you, you get first, whatever, first dibs, right? At expanding to to meet that um, to meet that market need. I think the other piece of it is, Sam, and I'm going to turn it to my colleague, Chris Dillon, who lives this every day, is um, the number of physicians who can do an ENT surgery at a Northwestern or a Copley may be different than the additional orthopedic surgeons that that practice at a Copley or Northwestern. So it's a kind of line by line um, kind of uh, answer to this puzzle, if you will. Um, I think the other thing I'll say is I'll point to history when we had to shut down the Fannie ORs due to air quality concerns. Um, we we proactively did reach out to our partners at Green Mountain Surgery Center, and I believe it was Northwestern. And Steve, you can pick this up if you want to, but and ask them. Could you help us take care of these patients that we are not going to be able to take care of because we can't operate these these ORs? So I think we do have evidence of collaborative partnership um, with with our regional partners. Um, And I'm going to now pass it. Chris, do you want to take the floor for a minute? Eve, I was I'm just actually gonna... all set. I think oh. Dr. Leffler okay. and Eve covered it nicely, but I know Dr. Eben had something he wanted to say. So go oh, ahead. Sorry. I was Thank just going to jump jump in, Sam, and I'll, I'll tell you that one of the things that I've done is gone around to every one of the hospitals in Vermont and asked how we can be better partners. And one of the key things that they've asked us to do is exactly what Steve mentioned, which is when they need us to take a patient, they would like us to take that patient, no questions asked. And one of the challenges that that a number of the hospitals have brought up is around cardiac surgery. So someone comes in with chest pain, they're suspecting that this patient is having a heart attack and is gonna need cardiac surgery. And they want that patient to be able to just come. And and ORs are jam packed because, and this volume that's going on in there um, impacts the surgeons that you're not hearing from today that do inpatient surgery. We can't take that patient today. And what that means for that hospital, whether that's neurosurgery, cardiac surgery, um, and other complicated surgeries is that then they scramble, typically out of state, but it means Boston, New Hampshire, New York, and it's a long ride or a long flight away from family and it delays care. That's the number one thing that they want us to help them with. So just, it's very, very tangible. It's very real that we're not meeting the standard that we want to meet for our Vermont residents here on, on this piece. The other part that, and I'll, I'll defer to the lawyers, but I'll bring it up is that like we have had no conversations, like we're not, I think we're very careful about allowing residents to be able to choose where they can go for surgery. Like, I don't think it would be appropriate for us to meet with other hospital leaders and say, why don't we decide as leaders that you're going to do urology surgery in this place and we're going to do otolaryngology surgery here. So don't hire anyone. You know, I I think that borders or if it's not directly illegal, it's probably border. So we're really careful. And I can tell you that we didn't have any of those conversations. I was really careful when people talked to me about it. I said, you know, we'd have to go work through legal staff to make sure we can have the conversation when we were talking about that. So that, that, Maybe, maybe inappropriately anxious and nervous about having inappropriate conversations, but but that's also something that was in the back of probably all of our minds when we're doing the collaboration of like how we want to work together is we want to be helpful to you. Tell us how we can be helpful. And but that's a little different than figuring out like you do what, you know, here and I'll do this there uh, piece of the conversation. So thanks for letting me jump in there. I know it was unplanned. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Very helpful. Um, this next question, the reference is page 50 of the binder, and this is from the initial application uh, where the medical center you wrote, this project will not result in an undue increase in the cost of medical care or an undue impact on its affordability. And you talked about how you develop your annual budgets, um, which I think we're all familiar with. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about how the medical center 
interprets the concept or defines undue increase in terms of affordability, particularly to, to patients. Rick, do you want to start? I'll start more with uh, the technical uh, piece of that, Sam, is I think you've, you've seen our budget presentations over the years and what, you know, what we look at for cost increases uh, or rate increases is 100% dependent on the cost inflation that we are projecting for the coming year. So what we, what we're projecting for staff salary increases, what we think supplies um, are going to go up by um, in any given year. Um, so we, we tie those, those increases specifically to that. Um, but then we look for opportunities, um, whether it's efficiencies, um, uh, additional uh, revenue streams to help offset the the impact of those increases every year is something that um, that we're looking at to try to impact positively affordability. When it relates to this project specifically, um, hopefully we've we've laid out the case that um, you've heard that cases shifting from inpatient and outpatient to this outpatient surgery center. Uh, will decrease uh, cost to patients. It'll decrease it, um, as Dr. Nichols uh, highlighted, from inpatient cases moving to outpatient, but even the current outpatient cases that do move into this OSC will drop the overall cost to patients, um, hopefully having a positive impact uh, on affordability. And Thank Sam, you. Yeah. what I would add just is, um, remember that there is no good alternative to this project. Without this project, by 2030, 4,000 Vermonters will either not get care. There's a significant cost to that. Delay care, there's a cost to that. And some of those people will get sicker and end up in the hospital or have to travel out of state for care, which to an individual could ask significant cost to having your family come home, the travel, return for visits. So there is a cost to not having access. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, next question, the references, this is on page 180 of the binder. Uh, this is in your responses to some questions from the board. You wrote, to achieve the projected operating margins from FY24 through 26, and I realize this might have changed throughout the process, um, so correct me if this is wrong. One of the assumptions you make is that revenue rate approvals will continue to keep pace with cost inflation, and I'm wondering if the medical center has a contingency plan for the project if the board decides, as it did last year, that reductions to the rate increase request are warranted. So, Sam, I'm going to start and then I'm going to have Rick do the fine details. So, at a high level, this project's about patient care. We need this project to take care of people who need our services. It's a benefit that the project has a margin and returns a margin relatively quickly because that allows us to use those dollars for other critical purposes that don't earn a margin. But at the end of the day, this project is about caring for people. There's a lot of assumptions in any budget, um, but the root of this project is to help people get access to care in a timely fashion. And so I want to make sure that you and the board hear that the margin is a positive, good benefit because we can use those dollars for other purposes, but we need the project whether the budgets get adjusted or not. And so I'll let Rick add some detail to that, but thank you. Yeah, I think it's important to, to realize that we were asked to do two things as part of this OSC submission. So one is what Eve went through at the beginning that showed the incremental increase of this project and it came with a certain set of assumptions. And then two, we were asked to, to look at the, the broader UVM Medical Center projections and how um, how this fits into that broader projection. But in terms of that assumption of rate inflation keeping pace with inflation, um, that really is that's that's our that's our broader kind of budget um, submission discussion, not really part of this OSC. Um, so that's that's the assumption that we have today as part of our financial framework, but it isn't um, it isn't part of the assumption that we have necessarily tied to um, this OSC application. Okay, thank you. Um, and the last question, I think this builds off Dr. Leffler, your your comments. I'm wondering if you could speak to how the medical center weighs other health needs in the community, 
such as, you know, documented needs for mental health and how you evaluate what projects to seek certificate of need approval for either now or going into the future? Sam, it's such a great question. We have so many challenges right now in terms of meeting the needs of Vermonters. We're behind in terms of the amount of building and space and equipment that we need. And so we're working on a long range master facility plan, which I'm sure at some point will be in front of this board. This project was picked now for a couple of reasons. Number one, we feel the need every single day right now. We've done tremendous work over the past 18 months to improve the capacity of our ORs and do more surgeries. We're setting records most months now. And we're still, even with all that work, building up a backlog. And Chris Dillon would tell you that we've about maxed out on what we can do on campus. This project can come online relative, relatively quickly with Green Mountain, with approval from the board. By um, May of 26, it could be online if we get approval this summer. Um, and importantly, it does generate a positive margin, and those dollars can go to other parts of the mission that don't. So if we invested in something that was losing money first, that's detracting from other options. So for multiple reasons, this project is the right project now and sets us up for some other big, important things that need to be done in the honestly relatively near future. Okay, thank Chris, you. Do you I appreciate it? it. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Snell, uh, do you have any questions? Yes, I like do, please, ask? thank you. Yes, and I would like to echo Sam in his thanking the board and the UVMMC representatives here with this presentation. Um, and if you will bear with me, um, I just wanna run over some data that was included in the original application and some of your responses. And then I think I only have one question um, you indicated in question 11 that um, for every 1% increase in wages, um, we'll reduce your OSC total margin by about $240,000 annually. So in the original application on page 36, um, for direct care staff for fiscal year 26 to 27 and 27 to 28, for each year, you have a 3% increase listed. Um, that same holds true for indirect staff. At this point in time, indirect staff, I have to assume, is uh, your central sterile processing, housekeeping, everyone that helps keep the facility running. And they currently have a 5% increase built into their next year, actually the next two years. In um, question two on page five, dated June 15th of 23, you listed pay increases for fiscal year 25 as 4%, 26 as 4%, and 27 as 3%, with 0% listed for travel labor. And in this current presentation, under salary and wages, and I understand they are not broken down by direct, indirect, or by physician, um, but by the category in general under salary, wages, and other, for fiscal year 26, you have listed a 3.9% increase total. And in fiscal year 27 to 28, only a 1.89% increase. So I guess my question is, um, as we know, there are many contract negotiations going on currently. And is this, a reasonable number to have just 3% um, when we're having so much trouble attracting staff to our facility. Thank you, Deb. Um, as you mentioned, we are in nursing negotiations right now and tech negotiations follow that. We're hard at work with you, working on a good contract. Um, I can't comment on exactly what numbers were put in there. They were based on the percentage of inflation, I'm assuming, and I'll let Evie answer that, but um, we need to have this project and staff to staff it. And um, I, I think it's a both. And so we'll, we'll work to get good, strong contracts that pay our staff fairly. Um, and then like everything else, work around it in the budget. So Eve, do you wanna comment on how the numbers are put into the, the model? 
Yeah, I, I, I'm going to start and then I'm going to turn it to Mark, um, who is my partner for estimating about um, co cost increases. Deb, um, we spent a lot of time going through position by position, and this is back in 21 and, and 22, revisited in 22, and making sure that those starting, so you know, you talk about the growth, but we also wanted to make sure those starting salaries, the current state salaries, reflected the, the current state of things, um, right? So for travelers and, and our expectations going forward for nurses and different positions. So I want to assure you that those starting baseline um, uh, wages um, were, were done very thoughtfully and in full recognition of the kind of conversations that were that were going on at the time and our workforce challenges um, at, at the time. In hindsight, I would say that I just was looking at some of the, the traveler assumptions and um, and because traveler costs have come down, we probably overstated um, some of those wages for travelers, but I would rather have erred on the conservative side um, than on the aggressive side. Let me um, turn it to Mark for um, the assumptions that that we put forward on the on the growth over the time frame. Thank you, Eve. Let me just pull up the file so I can speak to it. Okay. So, Deb, you're exactly correct. Okay. So, um, in our model, and 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 I will say this is a model that um, about 60% of our costs, give or take, will relate to salary and fringe, and there was a higher percentage allocated to those to those salary and fringe categories, and then all of the other categories, which accounts um, for about 40% of our expense, there's um, a zero to a 3% where well, that was applied. And there's also med surge and drug expenses that ha have a little bit higher percentage than the 3%. But when you average all of this out across all of our expenses, you know, um, the cost inflation uh, was normalized um, in the three and a half to 5% range, depending on what year of the projection whether that you looked at. Um, and I think to Eve's point, there's other components in this too, that um, uh, we do know our assumption on the traveler, since there was a higher utilization there, that there's a little bit of favorability in there also. And then the other thing I think to consider that this is cost inflation. Um, this project is gonna create so many efficiencies. It's actually gonna hopefully take some of the pressure off future cost inflation because we can do services that we're doing today more efficiently. Um, and at the same time, it's gonna be better for the patients from an access perspective and also a cost perspective to the patients. So there's other components than just what the pure cost inflation is. There's Doing our jobs better today is going to relieve some of the pressure on future cost inflation. And at the same time, it is going to be more cost effective for the patients that we deserve. And I think like Dr. Leffler said, um, we are committed to working with all of our staff. These are our assumptions. Our financial framework is updated every 12 months and every 12 months as as more knowns become true it is updated but you know this is this is this is a commitment that we're not only making to our staff to make sure they're paid what they deserve to get paid for the services they provide but also to bring um the base cost as most efficiently as we can to our patients well to reduce their cost also thank you um so are you saying that you said that it's updated every 12 months? Is there somewhere in this presentation that you show the increase, especially for the indirect staff, their increase of 5%? We provided a breakdown, I think, of all of the staffing categories that was built into this model assumption. But the point of it being updated every 12 months is as we know more of what the actuals are, we update our projections um, and then we model it forward for the next five years. And 
have you um, looked at projections with higher wages to see what the reduction in your OSE total margin would be? So maybe I can jump in, Mark. Yes, so right. I think, again, going back to the original ask of this, uh, Deb, was to present an incremental p l or increase for the OSC specifically. I think we're mixing we're mixing two things here because we're also talking about the broader UVM Medical Center budget. So mm -hmm. what Mark's talking about is those broader assumptions that are updated every year. But specific to the OSC, um, we were asked to just present essentially a point in time uh, projection on what the incremental uh, increase is. I understand. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you. <clears throat> so next we'll move to Northwestern Medical Center. Mr. Wright, are you with us? I don't believe Peter is on at this time. Um, he's uh, probably in the air. Um, but I am here and, and we have no um, additional questions. Appreciate the presentation today. Um, the team has done a really nice job laying this project out and explaining it. And we appreciate the conversation throughout the process. So no questions from NMC. Thank you, Mr. Billings. And uh, Copley, Mr. Wooden, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Uh, yes, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> Let me just express my appreciation for this process. I know it's a lot of work and everybody's involved. I'm glad it's not political and we all try to work together to come up with the best answers. Um, certainly we learned a lot through COVID and um, I know Dr. Leffler, I've spoken to him a couple times as well as Dr. Eben. The medical center has been very helpful. I think we've been through a um, very difficult number of years and uh, we've never seen this in our career where we, we can't get access to the highest level of care. So I think they've always been very gracious, very fair, and um, <clears throat> we usually join them in the lament when they're like, we can't accept or we're trying to figure it out. So a lot of hospitals in the state have been under a lot of stress with just lack of capacity. So uh, a couple questions I have, uh, one of them is, with regards to the forecasting that E4H provided, but anybody can answer it. Uh, I noticed that when you look at the counties that sort of uh, encompass and wrap around UVM, Chittenden, Washington, Grand Island, Franklin, there was no addressing of Lamoille County where we are or Addison County, which I thought was kind of interesting because if you just sort of draw a line, those are the ones that you sort of draw from. And I just was wondering why those were absent in particular because there's the discussion of, you know, not um, trying to take away any business from others, you know, everybody's sort of growing, but those two counties were missing. So I'm just curious why they weren't included in the assessment. Eve, do you, are you able to answer that? Happy, happy, happy to answer that. So, Joe, um, I was asked to be brief. Every everyone's going to laugh because I love the details. Um, and uh, I was asked to be brief in this presentation. We'd be happy to um, share share those numbers with you. A as you know, I think that um, <laughs> we we are seeing growth, and probably um, the theme is the same for um, Addison County and Lamoille County. Um, um, both in and and from a forecasting point of view, but um, but higher growth than was predicted prior to 2020, right? And the 2020 census gave us information that more people are moving to this area, and it's not just the Chittenden County area. It's it's definitely um, hitting the surrounding environment. So um, I'm happy to provide provide those those numbers to you. But the themes are are, are extremely extremely similar. Okay, that's helpful. It's just curious that they weren't there. Um, the other, the other issue is so Copley is um, sort of a specialty orthopedic orthopedics critical access hospital. I know over the years we've talked about centers of excellence in Vermont as we plan for healthcare, um, where some small hospitals or others might need to specialize. We don't do ENT. 
Uh, we don't do significant urology. There's a lot of stuff we don't do, but that is one of them that we do. I know for years I worked at Gifford for 17 years. They were known for their OB birthing center, absolutely considered a you know center of excellence for that. So when it comes to sort of the discussion about competitiveness, which I'm sort of surprised about because we're we're small. We're only three percent of the uh, budget slice for the state of Vermont, so we try to sort of hold our own. But when you look at bed capacity or needs, so I think we have four beds out there from the Green Mountain Surgery Center that got awarded a few years ago. I don't know where those are. Um, the only two sort of immediately near UVM would be ourselves and Northwest Medical Center. I know we are really close to being at capacity. I know Northwest Medical Center, from what I understand, they might have some capacity and extra room. I'm sure you, you're looking at Porter as well as Central Mont Medical Center, as well as Rutland, if you actually consider those counties that I mentioned that Eve said the data is there. So I'm just wondering, um, do, do we know the bed capacity and the future plans for those others that sort of ring around the medical center to make sure that we're not overbuilding. I only ask that because we have three ORs and um, eight or nine ORs is sort of like three times the number of ORs. We have each one of our ORs takes care of about 2,500 cases, not the um, procedure rooms, but we do about 2,500 cases per OR. So. Just wondering about that thought about the capacity analysis and looking at other hospitals. Thanks. Eve, Eve do you know what other work went into, um, once again, what I know about this project, Joe, is kind of what you just said. We knew the Copley was about at capacity. We knew there may be some fractional opportunity at Northwest, but not enough to meet the 4,000 patient need. And um, we really looked at our own service area, the people that are already coming to us. So we're supportive of Copley having an orthopedic program. Great care happens there. We know it well. We're not trying to compete with Copley. We're trying to serve the patients in our region who need timely access to care. And as we've already times, I firmly believe that the outpatient surgery center moving some cases from the medical center to the OSC will let CT surgery happen faster and neurosurgery happen faster on the main campus, which opens up beds to send your critical ER patient down today instead of tomorrow morning, which is really important. We know that. So I don't know if you have fine details, but um, we're not competing with Copley on this project. Yeah, correct, correct. Um, and I think those people from Chittenden County, um, Joe, who do choose to go to Copley and to, to um, have your excellent surgeons do, do their orthopedic surgery, um, I would expect that you would see that market growth that we project for Chittenden County, to, um, you know, happening for you. Um, in terms of looking at capacity from nearby hospitals, um, I think you'll see in our responses to the Green Mountain Care Board questions, I think particularly in Q9, um, we talked about um, the, the very detailed look we took at our own partner hospitals. We were not aware of any excess capacity um, that was um, that that was you know at Copley or um, Northwestern in specific terms, and you really, as you know, you really need to get down to those specifics because, for example, you can take orthopedics, but you're not going to take ENT cases, right? So it's a, it's a. I think if I got that right, um, so it it com it comes down to to some of some of those um, some of those details. So I think the other piece, Joe, is that. We really thought a lot about access, timely access, and we thought a lot about health equity. And, and I think the OSC is not meant to take our special cases. It's meant to take, you know, lots of different orthopedic cases, lots of different um, OBGYN cases, and so on and so forth. And so we wanted to make sure that we could give patients who lived in Chittenden County who might have transformation uh, transportation challenges. Um, the ability to to go someplace that was um, close to home, and so that that was a big factor um, factor into our into our planning as well. Chris Dillon, did I miss anything that we no, talked about I, and talked about? Uh, no, I, I would just add for CVMC and Porter, we looked at them extensively in collaboration with you know, leaders at those organizations, 
And we believe that within five years, we're going to be using all the capacity at those sites as well. It's also to important to remember that you know, a room is not a room is not a room. So we know that one of CVMC's ORs is undersized, and we know that one third of the capacity at Porter is in their 285 square foot procedure room. And we know that that's well below FGI guidelines for anything constructed new at this point. So um, yeah, I would just add those two points and agree it's sort of a, a yes and. We desperately need this project we're here to talk about today and we need to continue to utilize our partners. Thank you. Great, thanks for that. And um, la last question, we learned a lot from COVID, which was helpful. And it's not that it's all gone, but as we plan in the future, I think <clears throat> the pressure on the tertiary care centers was overwhelming, the inability for the small hospitals to handle a lot of things was overwhelming. And I know we're trying to figure that out, not to overbuild, but to make sure, you know, in my mind, it's an issue of, um, diversity to make sure that in different locations in Vermont, because I've I've heard this many times, if you if you closed a bunch of small hospitals, both for Dartmouth and UVM, they would just be overwhelmed and life would be horrible and nobody would want to see that happen. So when we plan, it's always nice to make sure that we're holistically planning so that we have that balance so that if something does go wrong, whether it's the medical center and we certainly hate to send anybody there that we might be able to take care of um, because there's just too much demand. So I know that issue of looking at all the hospitals, allowing for centers of excellence, if that makes sense, and sometimes those just organically grow, I think is helpful, hard to predict though. But um, I don't have any other questions, but thanks everybody. It is a complicated process and I know the medical center does need help. My first response might be that, well, the medical center should build inpatient beds <laughs> so that they can take care of the most acute needs to put them up in the ICU and sort of manage them. But I think they're doing that with this model because they're just trying to take out their outpatient business, move it aside so that their more acute inpatient care can be satisfied. So I get that. And that makes sense to me because you wouldn't want to just build in the medical center. But thanks for thanks for your time. Appreciate it. So um, unless there's any comments to uh, what Mr. Wooden just said, I, I think taking a lunch break at this point in time before moving to board questions makes sense, unless anyone has an issue with that. I, I propose we come back at uh, 1230. We're actually doing pretty good on time. So um, 45 minutes for lunch, come back at 1230, move to questions from the board um, and take it from there. Okay, so let's go off record and see everyone at 1230. Thank you.